Welcome back to Lewisburg College Online. Indeed, you are listening to Biology 140, Environmental Biology, on the airwaves uh, 24-7 for your convenience. Uh, to be able to teach my class due to our lousy weather about environmental biology. Well, we just finished an exciting chapter on food, agriculture, and hunger. Now we're going to talk about something that is part of the same subject, but a little more onerous. Let's start off with a fact that a lot of people do not want to believe. As we said in chapter nine on food and agriculture, conventional agriculture requires a tremendous amount of inputs. And those inputs are expensive, very expensive. One of the things that has developed since World War II is pesticides, okay? Pesticides, very simple word, okay? They are chemicals that control pests. Bottom line is, get this, important, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, it's located in downtown Rome, FAO comes out with a report every year on world food production and where we're at. Consistently, for the past 30 years, here is their number. For conventional agriculture, obviously we're not talking about organic agriculture, but for conventional agriculture, which is still 95% of world agriculture, overall, 50% of our harvest would be destroyed on an annual basis by insects, diseases, fungi, bacteria, viruses, mycoplasmas, rickettsia, and weeds. Insects, diseases, and weeds. 50% of our crop harvest will be destroyed if we, in fact, do not use these compounds. Uh, I mean, it would be nice if that wasn't the case. But you know something? The way good Lord made the earth is that, yes, we plant food because we have to eat on the other hand, the Lord made all kinds of organisms from birds to frogs to insects and everything else who are just going as much as going to try to eat our food as we do. Okay, they want to survive and they are hungry. So, when we take a look at our slide here, we see that there are a whole bunch of different classes of these, quote, pesticides. Pests mean pests, okay? By the way, a cute definition of a pest. A pest is an organism, a weed, a bacteria, an insect, that's in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's the definition of a pest. It is. Okay? You know, that's life. You know, you're not getting rid of insects, guys. Okay? So the reality is, is that we don't want the pest there, and hence, we cite it. Okay? Definition, kill it. So insecticide, obviously, pesticides that kill insects. Fungicide, pesticides that kill fungi. Major problem, fungi rot crops. Bactericide, bacteria. Nematicide, something that you may not be familiar with, which is something that you need to be familiar with. In the soil, if I went right outside this house right now and took a handful of soil and I screened that soil, Okay, at the microscopic level, what I would find is that there are thousands of tiny microscopic round worms. Not talking about earthworms, annelid worms, the big ones, fishing. I'm talking about microscopic round worms in the soil. These microscopic round worms have little stylets in their mouths, like this, and they put it into the root. It's in the soil. They put it into the root of the plant and they suck the nutrients out, causing billions of dollars of damage every year on practically every crop in the world. Rodenticide doesn't sound like a big deal until you're a farmer 
that's growing a crop that happens to grow near the ground or at the surface of the ground like peanuts, they're called rats and mice and vermin, okay? Rodenticides. Avicide, well, that's kind of sad. Birds, okay? Well, again, you're Farmer Jones. You're out in 10,000 acres of corn in the middle of Iowa, and you're woken up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Whoa, what's going on here? Outside, you open the door, you go outside, and there are 100,000 starlings, blackbirds. Okay, they're about that long, kind of a purplish-colored blackbird. On your corn, sitting up there on the plants, pecking away, picking out the corn kernels. Not something to make you happy. Okay, they are not pleased about that. Now, the old story is you go out with your shotgun. Well, I got news for you. A shotgun ain't going to kill 100,000 starlings. And by the way, it's legal to kill them if they are in your food. Okay, what do they do? Sad. They put out baited corn (laughs) on the ground. Okay, and the corn has a neurotoxin in it. So you put it out. You come back the next morning, and guess what you got? Thousands of dead birds lying on the ground. Okay? I told you, I didn't say I'm I'm enjoying talking about this, but the fact is, is that without these kinds of chemicals, you would be in a lot of trouble with conventional agriculture. Finally, biocide. Bio means life. Side means side. Kill. This is a group of compounds, mostly called fumigants, that are put in the soil that, what do they kill? Everything. And I might add, including you, if you get exposed to it. Very, very toxic, regulated chemicals that are used to kill all kinds of things out in the soil. Well, the golden age of pesticide research began right before the dawn of World War II. Uh, And here is a good story, bad story. Uh, And I'm not saying this to be unkind, but basically up until World War II, unquestionably the greatest chemists in the world came from Germany. Okay, you take a look at every chemistry Nobel Prize from 1940, uh, excuse me, uh, 1895 up through World War II, it was German chemists that were coming up with some of the greatest chemical discoveries in the world. Well, along came Nazism in 1933, and Hitler and his minions put to work the chemists of Germany to form all kinds of new chemicals many of them, as you can imagine, for warfare. And that's where wonderful things like Zyklon B and the Auschwitz gas chambers and other things were developed. But as a result of this biocide chemical warfare work, whole new classes of chemicals were discovered. Okay, Paul Mueller in 1939, discovered a chemical that was first looked at for biowarfare, found not to work very well, but found to work very, very well on killing insects, DDT. Probably one of the most remarkable insecticides, if not the most remarkable, ever invented. No one has ever come in second place. DDT wipes out particularly mosquitoes. Take a look at film clips in uh, the Philippines during World War II. They would take DDT powder and spray it on the soldiers. Cover them white from head to toe. They'd strip down and spray DDT powder on them. Why? Well, you know, we think about the Japanese and bombs and guns. No. Probably the single greatest killer of anybody during the Pacific War, during World War II, was a little thing called malaria. Tens of thousands died from malaria. Guess what? DDT prevents you getting bit and kills insects if they're even in a neighborhood. 
mosquitoes, DDT. Worked great. Everybody thought, this is incredible. We have finally found a compound that we can deal with that's going to take out insect populations. How many of you know the rest of the story? The rest of the story didn't come to light until 1963, when a 67-year-old woman, an artist on the coast of Maine, lived on the coast of Maine in a house. And she used to come out to draw pictures of the ocean. And there were ospreys. And there were puffins. Golden eagle. Bald eagles that were fishing along the coast. And by 1963, she went out and they were all gone. I mean kind of gone, sort of gone. I mean gone. All of these birds of prey were gone. And she started investigating it. And lo and behold, what did she discover? That the accumulation of DDT in the ovipositors of the female birds, that's what makes the egg, the calcium. DDT was a calcium channel blocker. And they made thin little eggs. And when mom and dad sat down on the eggs, what happened? Scrambled eggs. And of course, the birds died. And within a couple of years, they were eradicated. They were simply gone. The DDT prevented reproduction. By 1970, there were zero bald eagles in the lower 48 states. Zero. None. Now, to bring you up to date, if you were reading the newspaper here in Raleigh the other day, we now have 110 breeding pair. They mate for life. Boy and girl, bald eagles right here in central North Carolina uh, along Jordan Lake, mostly. Okay? They've come back. Why did it come back? Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, one of the most classic books in American literature. It's about that thick. You can read it in 40 minutes. Okay? Silent Spring woke up the entire nation. And in Silent Spring, she discovered by interviewing scientists that DDT was killing our wildlife, including our national heritage, the bald eagle. Bottom line, within six years, DDT was banned. Totally banned in the United States, and slowly the populations of these animals began to come back. Eagles had to be imported from Canada, because obviously there was nothing left to breed in the United States. They had to bring them back in where they started breeding and everything came out well. So, bottom line is that the age of pesticides brought about a miracle in agricultural growth, the means to feed billions of people, but even today, the indiscriminate use of pesticides forms cancers, forms all kinds of autoimmune diseases, okay? We are still in an age where thousands die from pesticide exposure every year. It's sad. And that, of course, the inverse of that is the reason why, quote, organic crops, no chemicals, are on the rise. So let's move on to pesticide classes. We have a bunch of classes I'd like you to know. We begin with the original pesticides. Pesticides aren't new. The Romans knew about pesticides, okay? There were certain elements, sulfur, mercury, copper, and it was discovered when you put this on a plant, it prevented insects, it prevented birds from eating it, it prevented certain fungi and bacteria, the most famous of which was Louis Pasteur. Now, was Louis Pasteur an agricultural scientist? Heck no. What was he famous for? Pasteurization of milk. The first vaccination, smallpox, okay? Discovered by the great French scientist Louis Pasteur. It is now 1868. What is the single greatest crop of France? Was, is, will always be grapes, for the production of vino, wine, single largest wine producing country in the world. 
there was an outbreak of an insect called phylloxera. Phylloxera, okay? And a little tiny sucking insect. And all the farmers went to the great pasteur at the Sorbonne in France, in Paris, and said, my God, our industry is about to be destroyed. Pasteur put on his thinking cap about what he knew about pesticides. And he took a giant copper bowl, huge copper bowl, put elemental sulfur. Everybody knows what sulfur looks like. It's, it's yellow. It's a yellow powder. Okay, natural. It's found in mines all over the world. Ground it up, put a couple of pounds of sulfur in the bowl and filled it with water. Okay, I'm talking about 100 gallons, big copper bowl. Stirred it around, stirred it around, stirred it around for a couple of days. First of all, what did he create by putting the sulfur in the water? A weak acid, sulfuric acid, okay, is formed by adding sulfur to water, H2SO4, okay? What did the weak acid do? It started eating away the copper in the bowl. And by stirring it around, he ended up with a slurry of copper sulfate. Copper sulfate. He created a new compound. They took it to the field, they sprayed it around, and lo and behold, what they find? It killed all the insects. And if you sprayed copper sulfate, on the plants, every two weeks, you prevented there from being any additional insect infestation. Louis Pasteur single-handedly was able to save the entire French grape industry. Believe it or not, copper sulfate is licensed today for organic farming because it is non-toxic to human beings and birds and everything else, okay? What's the name of the game? We can use it even today in crop production. All right, moving on. Natural organics. Okay? These, again, are different pesticides. We're talking about the good stuff right now, guys. Okay? This is something that is used in the organic farming industry, and it is legal. They are natural chemicals. Natural chemicals that make it legal to use even in organic farming. The first is, okay, this fall, I want everybody to grow chrysanthemums in their garden. Very pretty plant, okay, beautiful flowers. And at the end of the summer, they'll start turning brown. At the time that they are starting to turn brown, pick off the heads of the flower. Put them in a five-gallon pail of water. Let it sit. Out in the sun, even better. Let it get warm. Stir it around for a week. For a week. Strain out the flowers. What you have in that water is a mixture of what we call pyrethrum. Pyrethrum. And pyrethrum is a natural insecticide from the plant. And it works. From the tropics of the Amazon. There is a beautiful plant called the neem tree, N-E-E-M. And you slice the bark on the neem tree and it drips sap. You collect that sap. It's an oil, an actual oil. And you will be able to spray neem oil on trees to kill insects naturally. Okay? The next one's the coolest one of all. You know, you talk about, about knowledge. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the Amazon. I've gone there nine different occasions. And we always see this particular thing being demonstrated by the locals, by the Indians, by the indigenous people. Knowledge coming down from 30,000 years of trial and error by, in this case, uh, Peruvian Amazon Indians. There's a vine, a liana that grows in the Amazon, strings up and down the trees. They cut sections of those vines, take them to a rock. The women, the rock is next to a stream. Forgot to mention that, next to a stream. The women take rocks and start pounding, okay, those lianas, breaking them up. And as they pound them, this white, milky substance 
starts flowing out of it. Okay? While they're doing that, in the stream, a whole bunch of men are going upstream 100 yards and putting rocks in the stream, creating a dam. Okay? Not a total dam. It doesn't have to totally make the water rise, but a dam. The dam particularly to prevent the what? Fish from going downstream. Then, 100 yards upstream, they build another dam. Okay? So you got this area of stream, 100 yards, okay, long, with rocks here and rocks here, and it is sort of plugged up with a little water trickling through. They wave to the women. The women bring that rock, now covered with this white, gooey material, and they bring it to the upstream side and put it in the water. And it dissolves in the water like a milk. And as it slowly works its way, remember the stream is flowing, as it slowly works its way downstream, in about five minutes, they sit there, have a good time, smoke a cigarette, tell jokes, okay? As it goes downstream, suddenly, boop, 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 fish start popping up to the surface of the water. The men and women go in the water with their baskets, their hands, simply take the fish and put them in the baskets, okay? They take the fish, bring them to the shore, gut them out, lay them in the sun to dry. They're perfectly edible. All of the rodent-known toxin from the sap from the liana stunned their nervous system so they couldn't swim. They floated. They took them. Now, of course, now they take the rocks away. And all of that now flushes downstream and dilutes itself. And lo and behold, they have a toxin that actually works on killing the fish so they can harvest it. Well, guess what we found out? Not only does it work great on fish, but it works great on the neurological systems of insects. And you can go to the store today and buy a vial of rhodonone and pour it into water and dilute it and spray it on your trees, on your vegetables. It will quickly kill the insects and in a matter of hours dissipate to the point where it will have no effect on you or anything else. Remember, good news, bad news. Rotenone. Moving on. Okay. Next one we're dealing with is the worst of the worst. Went from the good. We'll talk about the bad in a second. Now we're talking about the ugly. Another product discovered by the Germans during World War II used to kill people, okay, was methyl bromide, which is a liquid when it is contained, and as soon as you put the liquid into air, it turns into a gas, a gas. So what do we use it for? Remember I said it is a biocide. What does it kill? Everything. It kills grubs, insects, worms, fungi, bacteria, Rats, human beings, okay, whatever is exposed to it. Some of you in eastern North Carolina might remember back in the old days of tobacco. There used to be fields in the spring covered with white plastic. It used to go around and be white plastic covering the field. What that was, was methyl bromide fumigation of the soil. You put the plastic down and you pop the can. So a pop-top type can throw it under the plastic, and run for your life. The fumigant fills up all the plastic and then goes down into the soil, a couple of inches, and what does it do? Sterilizes the soil. That way, when you took the plastic off in a week, okay, it was all gone, it had gone away, the seedlings, little seedlings of tobacco could be put in the ground and they would grow without any disease or insect problems. This was used literally for 50 years. Got news for you. Interesting time I'm talking. January 1st, 2015. Methyl bromide in all forms is banned. It is no longer allowed to be used. It is so toxic that the government said there's no way we are allowing it to be used anymore. Moving on. Okay. 
the group of compounds that are famous, uh, including DDT. Uh, it was, again, back in the World War II era that the chlorinated hydrocarbons, the chlorinated hydrocarbons were discovered. And what the chlorinated hydrocarbons do is that they are neurotoxins, specifically to insects. They're not that effective on people. As we said, you could spray a human being with DDT. I don't recommend it, okay? But they are highly toxic against insects. And for our purposes, DDT, Chlordane, Dildrin. I want you to remember those. Those are the three major chlorinated hydrocarbons. Moving on. A very powerful group of compounds. Again, our good old World War II. Remember, this is when all the modern age of pesticides came about, the organophosphates. That is where the most onerous of all compounds, Zyklon B, was, came from. It was an insecticide that they found out will very efficiently kill people. But even today, we have two registered compounds, parathione and malathione, that are used okay, as insecticides. They come from derivations of a nerve gas, which are organophosphates. Okay, finally, oh, the carbamates, forgot the carbamates. Carbamates are a group of compounds that, interestingly, <laughs> When I was at Cornell, I used to come home covered with this stuff. I wonder why I'm alive today. Carbamates were considered to be one of the safest of all the different compounds. They both act as insecticides and as fungicides. Until in about 1990, we found out that they were carcinogenic. Okay? They actually will cause cancer, but they will not kill you outright like those other things were. Seven and Zyneb, remember those. All right, the modern age of, quote, pesticidal research has gone into the realm of GMOs. Remember our last lecture? We talked about genetically modified organisms, okay? And what they are are natural microbial agents. BT is a bacteria, bacteria. Bacillus thuringiensis, don't worry about the name, okay? And what they did is they were able to take the gene for BT toxin, which kills insects out of the bacterium. This is a bacterial uh, disease of insects. Put it into corn. Now, when a corn borer goes on the ear of corn and starts nibbling, it takes one bite, it ingests it, and within a matter of minutes, it's down on the ground dying because the toxin has been inserted into the corn. Now, that makes it frankencorn. The corn that you eat contains Bt toxin. Is there any overt reason why Bt toxin is bad for you? How about this for an answer? We don't know. We don't know. We'll find out years from now, after everybody is finished eating these things, which are in our GMO supply. All right, the next slide illustrates something that um, we have uh, been able to illustrate. Next one. No, I'm sorry. That's it. Correct. That is correct. Uh, I said this at the outset of our discussion. Virtually half of the world's food supply. Virtually half of the world food supply would be destroyed by these pest organisms if it wasn't for pesticides. But, as I mentioned, they are extraordinarily dangerous. They are poisons. The fact that they are not acutely toxic to us, okay, makes us feel better. But the key word here is chronic toxicity. What if you have tiny little amounts of these chemicals for a week, a month, a year, 10 years, 50 years. What is the combined result? What's the answer? We don't know. We don't know. So we are taking a risk. 
The world takes a risk by using these carcinogens, these other compounds, in order that we can eat, okay? On the other hand, the overuse and misuse of these things can and does result in disease. Next slide. Okay. Migrant workers. Okay, this is a very, very sad story. Let's talk about this in a real, real term way. This is about 15 years ago in Garner, North Carolina, just south of Raleigh. There was a strawberry operation, not one of those pick your own. Okay, pick your own is where people go out and do it. This was a commercial strawberry operation where, in fact, they had an entire encampment of Mexicans, Chicanos, okay, that they kept there, and they are used for labor, and that's a whole other story that we're not going to get into, okay? Bottom line is, is that this particular farmer decided he had too many insects in his field, and it was time to harvest. And he sprayed parathione, a very toxic insecticide, a registered compound, on that field. Parathione has what's known as a reentry time of 72 hours. In other words, the time that you spray it, you have to wait 72 hours before you go back into that field. Otherwise, you're going to be sick. Long story short, he sent out 100 workers into the field the next day to pick the strawberries. Now, not only were the strawberries covered with these chemicals, and I don't know what happened to them later on. Hopefully, people washed them. Turns out that two women that were in that crew of strawberry pickers, we're talking about from sunup to sundown, picking strawberries, putting them in baskets that are being sold, were pregnant, early pregnancy. They probably didn't even know they were pregnant. They might have been a month or two in. Fast forward nine months, uh, both of them within a week gave birth to what, and this is a horrible term, but it is the correct medical term, they gave birth to monsters, an arm coming out of a neck, an eyeball on the side, the brains hanging out of the cavity. They survived after birth for a matter of minutes, I would say, thank God, before they died, okay? This was reported as being this horrible coincidence that these two Mexican women gave birth to these horribly deformed children. Turns out a group of pro bono, meaning free lawyers at Duke, heard about this. Make a long story short, it went to court. The guy is in prison today for manslaughter. Okay, They took away his farm and everything else. This isn't funny. It's not funny. Okay, That's what I mean by the misuse of chemicals, and this goes on around the world every day of the week. Okay, move that K ahead. Okay, what are the alternatives? Okay, there are a number of alternatives. My dear wife every spring goes out to the store and buys a gallon of ladybugs. Okay, and another gallon of praying mantises. Ladybugs and praying mantises love to eat little sucking insects. Now, I said, you make sure you put a fence around our property to make sure they don't go anywhere else because, of course, they do. But indeed, a month later, you'll be looking in our vegetable garden, and you'll see some ladybugs, and you'll see some praying mantises. This is natural control, natural pest control, okay? Let's move on. Integrated pest management. Here's a way of, this is known as the middle of the road, okay? The Buddha always said the middle path is the way to walk, okay? Let's be the Buddha. Remember I said that in conventional agriculture, if we don't spray, we are going to lose crop if it's a non-organic system. That's a fact. On the other hand, do we have insects? Do we have diseases? Do we have problems every year, every month of the year in a given crop cycle? The answer is no. For example, what do insects and diseases love? Water. If you have a really wet year, the fungi are going to cover your tomatoes and everything else. The insects will be gnawing away on everything. They love moisture. Well, guess what? Do we have a wet spring every year? Heck no. We have droughts. 
So the point is, if there are no pests, why are you spraying pesticides? This gave birth to a new era that I was part of in the 1970s called integrated pest management. Integrated pest management, okay? What you do, and it's really funny the way it's done, the best people to do it are Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. You hire them. High school age kids, okay? And after school on Friday, they come to your farm and you give them these butterfly nets. Okay, everybody knows what a butter, long net. And they go, they assign different rows of the field and they are taught to go like this. Back and forth as they walk. They're walking. Pace, pace, pace. Swoop, swoop, swoop. Pace, pace, pace. Swoop, swoop, swoop. And this is down to a science. And when they get to the end of the row, they turn over the butterfly net and empty it into a bag. And we'll put the label on. Row 12. Go down to the next row. Row 13. Bring it back to the barn. The lab, if you will. It doesn't have to be a lab. Okay? And the grower opens up each bag and does a count. How many Colorado potato beetles are there? How many aphids are there? How many caterpillars are there? How many grubs are there? Okay? And you know what they find? If it's been a really dry week, the answer is few to none. Why would you want to go and waste the money and the time and the pesticides to spray the field if you don't have any insects to spray? Bingo. Scouting. Integrated pest management. We now have predictive weather models that we can actually use where the farmer doesn't have to actually worry about it in order to be able to figure out what is going on in the field. All right. What are the other solutions? Uh, I mentioned before that many of the pesticides we use are registered. Registered pesticides, it's very important we register them. I have a pesticide license, okay? I probably need it to be renewed, as a matter of fact, because you want farmers that are out there spraying these things to know darn well what they're doing and how they're spraying it. Because if they don't, they're not only going to hurt themselves and they're going to hurt the environment, but they're going to kill people. And so we have a new age where these pesticides are being looked at with much greater, much greater eyes and discrimination, the fact that we are trying to keep it to a minimum in terms of the use. Okay? Good. So, what are the worst? The big five. Something I tell all my students to and I try to follow at my house Basically, strawberries, bell pepper, cherries, peaches, and grapes. More pesticide is sprayed on these crops than just about any other crop. The reason is, obviously, they have a lot of insects and diseases. Okay, that's why they do it. They're not doing it for their health. On the other hand, remember what we said, that you cannot be assured that the amount of pesticide you're getting on a bag of strawberries is truly at the level that it is non-discernible. Therefore, it is essential that you spray them with a weak detergent and wash them before you are using them again. Now, how do you get around that very quickly? Organic crops. Okay, if you grow organic food, you do not have to worry about this entire thing. So, summary. Okay, chapter 10, we've talked about pests, pesticides, what they are, how they're classified, what the big ones are. The bottom line is, is that for now, until scientists figure out a better way, we are bound, if we are going to feed 7.3 billion people today, to use a certain amount of chemicals and or other means of crop production. Okay? What is the good news on the rise, huge rise, organically grown foods? To be an organic farmer, you need a PhD, okay? Anybody can grow food. To be an organic farmer, you have to be smart. You have to have incredible knowledge, okay, about how to grow food with zero chemicals, absolutely none, 
not allowed, and it's very carefully monitored. Okay, you have any chemicals that you're selling on organic food, you will lo- you'll be fined, and then you'll lose your license for five years. So it's not funny, okay? So again, good news, bad news. This is the state of world agriculture, and you need to know about it. That brings us to the end of Chapter 10 on our Lewisburg College Distance Education Channel, Nissan Communications. Stand by for an exciting lecture on Chapter 11.